In this video, I want to summarize and analyze the philosophy of a Buddhist philosopher named Nagarjuna, who lived in southern India in the late 2nd to early 3rd century. He is of immense importance to East Asian Buddhism and its philosophy in the Mahayana tradition, especially in Tibet, but also substantially in China, Korea, and Japan. I don't plan to do a full historical survey of Buddhism or its philosophy in this video, nor of the influence Nagarjuna's way of thinking would have on religious praxis and religious ideals in Buddhism, as interesting as those topics might be, and I might return to them in another video. However, I want to focus on him from a purely philosophical perspective in this video, because I think that is how his work can be most broadly enjoyed, entertained, and dealt with. Much of the problems he grapples with are very similar to ones that are in modern analytic philosophy in the 20th century, and the couple centuries leading up to that. David Hume and Ludwig Wittgenstein are two philosophers who we can especially see echoes of Nagarjuna in. Nagarjuna dwells a lot in contradictions and very strange-sounding points, and it's obvious that he gave influence to Zen's tradition of koans in Japan and China. However, I really want to dwell the point, uh, drill in the point here that Nagarjuna is not a mystic. He is very rigorous in his argumentation, even though he does not shy away from contradictions. As I said, I won't do a full historical history here, but I do have to introduce the tradition that he would have been the philosophical orthodoxy of Nagarjuna's time in Buddhism, to see the ways he agrees with and takes a lot of the assumptions they make as obvious, but also disagrees with much of the assumptions that they take as obvious. I also need to include some arguments and ways of understanding from his later commentators, because Nagarjuna's work itself is rather cryptic and austere, and um, very succinct, and in that way difficult to interpret, but he has a very rich tradition of commentators in India going all the way up until about the 8th, 9th century, where Buddhism kind of dwindles in India. However, at that time, his influence really moves into Tibet by some of his followers in the school he created, which is called Madhyamaka. I've cited my sources in the description of this video, which I really am stealing most of my arguments here from, because I just want to present them more than trying to add anything of my own, but you can read them for yourself if you want to engage with them in the comments. They're namely two Stanford Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy articles, one by Jan Christoph Westerhoff on Nagarjuna himself, and one by Richard Hayes on the Madhyamaka tradition in India. There's also a YouTube interview with J.L. Garfield, which is very useful for situating Madhyamaka in the broader history of Buddhist philosophy and development of Buddhism in general. I highly encourage anyone to read those articles and listen to that interview if they're interested in this stuff. In Nagarjuna's time, the dominant Buddhist philosophical positions were from a tradition called Abhidharma, which had existed since about the 3rd century BC and were concerned with analyzing Buddhist sutras and Buddhist texts for their philosophical positions. And there's three real takeaway points that Nagarjuna is going to pick up on and develop his philosophy with. And the first of these is called anicca, or impermanence. Anicca, or impermanence, asserts that nothing can last forever because nothing can stay the same forever with all of the same features. Rather, what the Abhidharma think is that things only exist for a moment and then subsequently give birth to the next moment and the next and the next, each one slightly different than the last. Therefore, if you try to 
analyze a certain thing, all you'll find is a bunch of infinitesimally small, atomic, singular moments of existence that change immediately and constantly give birth to something new. The next tenet of the Abhidharma is anatta, or non-self, which, as its name explains, simply states that there is no such thing as a self. We can prove this when we try to analyze what the self is. So what is the self? The self has to be something consistent underneath all the phenomena that happens to us. So is the self the body? Clearly not because the body changes throughout our life. It quite literally constantly destroys and recreates the very cells that it's constructed from. What about thoughts or feelings? Clearly not, since our thoughts and feelings also vary constantly and can easily change. Is the self in the memories? A lot of people consider it to be such, but our memories aren't stable either, as we can forget things or misremember them or even get amnesia or Alzheimer's. The only choice we're left with, then, is that there is no self underneath, but all we really are is a bundle of phenomena, ever-changing, that has the illusion of having a self. The last Abhidharma philosophical tenet I'm going to introduce is Pratityasa Mutpada, or Dependent Origination, which is a more complicated idea, but is essentially that everything is dependent on something else in three distinct ways. The first way that everything is dependent on something else for its origination is causal dependence. Everything must be caused by something else. No cause can ever be the first cause, because it is impossible that a cause can either cause itself or be caused by nothing, meaning that these chains of causes go back through the infinite toward what is often called in Buddhist texts beginningless time. The second way that everything is dependent on something else for its origination is physical dependence. In this way, parts of things are dependent upon the wholes of things, and the wholes of things are dependent upon their parts. For a classical example, we can analyze a chariot. Though a chariot seems like a singular object at first, when we analyze it, we find that it's composed of various smaller objects, like wheels and canopies. However, if we look at a wheel, we'll find that it's composed also of various small objects, such as spokes. But if we consider a spoke, we can find it reducible to an infinitesimal number of small atoms. This can continue on indefinitely. The third way in which everything is dependent on something else for its origination is conceptual dependence. In this case, it's dependent on the conception of the person who calls a thing what it is. For example, we analyzed a chariot to see that it's really composed of smaller objects which can be composed of smaller objects which can go down infinitely. Therefore, whatever we consider an object is a mere conceptual projection on an infinite number of reducible phenomena. Nagarjuna does not disagree with any of these three philosophical positions. However, his philosophy universalizes and radicalizes this doctrine of dependent origination through what is called the shunyata of dharmas, or the emptiness of phenomena. When Nagarjuna says that all dharmas are shunyata, or empty, we have to ask, empty of what? Because something can't just be empty it has to be empty of something. What he has in mind is an emptiness of svabhava, or self-essence. Something's svabhava is its true essence. It is what makes it what it is. The svabhava of water is to be wet. What is important about svabhava 
is that it has to exist independent of anything else, because it is what makes the thing what it is, and it has to make it what it is independently of anything else. If we remember the Abhidharma, we remember how they thought the world could be reduced down to a bunch of atomically small, single instances of time, consciousness, and such phenomena that constantly die in one moment and directly cause the next, with no continual self between them. These are what the endless chain of dependent origination is ultimately birthed from for them. So in other words, this dependent origination of small, singular, infinitesimal, atomic instances of phenomena would be the svabhava of reality to the Abhidharma. Nagarjuna rejects this and says that this kind of svabhava will never be found in any phenomena, no matter how deeply we reduce them and thus that all phenomena are empty of svabhava. It is because they are dependently originated that they have to be empty of svabhava. Nagarjuna's philosophy consists primarily in critiquing the idea of svabhava by showing its inconsistency. The first argument against svabhava is that of causation. The Abhidharmas would claim that dependent origination is the svabhava of phenomena, as all things are dependently originated, and thus that this chain of causation is the underlying svabhava of phenomena. But Nagarjuna rejects this. His argument is that there are four ways for something to be causally produced, but none of these is coherent. The first way that something could be causally produced is from itself. This argument is simple. Something cannot be produced from itself because it would then have to come before itself in time, which is impossible. One might also argue that the effect is pre-existent in the cause. But this is incoherent, because if the effect is already pre-existent, it wouldn't need a cause to be born in the first place. The second way that something could be causally produced is from another thing. This is where the argument becomes a little more complicated. It's somewhat intuitive to us that an effect can't be an effect independently of a cause, and therefore the effect is dependent on the cause. But how can a cause be dependent on its effect? It is, but not in the same way. We can use our example again of a chariot to illustrate this. If I ride in my chariot, what is the cause of its movement? Is it the wheels rotating from the machinery? Is it the horses that gallop to make the machinery turn? Is it me pulling the reins to make the horses gallop? Is it my will to pull the reins making me pull the reins? Is it me waking up in the morning that made me come here and get in the chariot and pull the reins and have the will? Is it my being born, since if I was not born I wouldn't have woken up in the morning? The only thing that ties all these phenomena together is the effect of the chariot moving. This can be thought of physically as well. To use Westerhoff's example, an explosion can be caused by petrol, oxygen, and a spark, but we only look at these objects as a cause based on the effect of the explosion. Since cause and effect thus ultimately depend on each other to be defined, they can't have an independent svabhava. If cause or effect could have a svabhava independent of each other, they wouldn't count as cause and effect. The third way that something could be causally produced is both from itself and 
from another thing. The example that Westerhoff uses for this one is that of a block of marble and the statue it becomes upon being carved. The statue and the marble are not wholly distinct, but not wholly separate. However, this is actually arguing Nagarjuna's point for him, as they only can be called a cause or effect dependent on each other, and thus cannot exist with independent svabhava. The fourth and final way for something to be causally produced is from neither itself or another thing. However, since something cannot be produced from nothing, the only way to argue is that there is, in fact, no causal relation whatsoever. But this is in direct contrast to the above-discussed idea of dependent origination, and it is insufficient to explain the way the world works. For it is not the case that things are produced randomly, but rather that there's an order to what brings about what effect and when. Thus, as cause and effect are dependent not just on each other to be defined, but also on our own conception of them, the objects that they produce will similarly be conceptually constructed and empty of svabhava. Of course, because of dependent origination, all things are born of cause and effect. Thus, all things are empty of svabhava. Buddha Palita, an early commentator on Nagarjuna, argued that similarly that there were four ways for cause and effect to be related and each one was incomprehensible. The first way for cause and effect to be related is that the cause is the same as the effect. But if the cause were the same as the effect, it would thus already exist and defeat the very purpose of having a cause and effect to begin with. The second way for cause and effect to be related is that the cause is different from the effect. But if we take this to be true, there would thus be no restraints on what can arise from what as long as they are different. The third way for cause and effect to be related is that the cause is both the same and different from the effect. However, this is merely a conjunction of the previous two impossible hypotheses, so it too is incoherent. The fourth and final way for cause and effect to be related are that the cause is neither the same nor different from the effect. However, there is no other possibility than for the cause to be the same or different from the effect, meaning that there would have to be no cause. If there were no cause, then an effect would have to arise from nothing, which is also incoherent. The Madhyamaka philosopher Chandra Kirti follows this line of reasoning by arguing that there are two ways for phenomena to arise, both of which are incoherent. The first way for phenomena to arise is from themselves, but this would make arising redundant because they had already existed in order to make themselves arise. The second way for phenomena to arise is from what is different. However, if phenomena arose from what is different, there would be nothing against saying that anything could arise from anything as long as they were different, such as darkness arising from light. Jnanagarbha proposed four ways of conditions producing effects and showed each one as being incoherent. The first way that conditions can produce effects is for many conditions to produce a single effect. However, many conditions like the eye, color, and the mind can't produce one effect, such as vision, as there is nothing to account for the reduction of many things into one. The second way for conditions to produce effects is for many conditions to produce many effects. However, if this is the case, we have only two options, both of which are incoherent. In the first option, each component of the complex cause is producing one component of the complex effect. 
However, this is the same as saying that it is a number of instances of one condition producing one effect, which will be shown shortly to be incoherent. Otherwise, we can say that each component of the complex effect is caused by multiple components of the complex cause. However, this is the same as many conditions producing a single effect, which we have shown above to be incoherent. Furthermore, we cannot explain how the same totality of causes can have different effects. The third way for conditions to produce effects is for a single condition to produce many effects. However, here one needs to coherently explain how a single condition can produce multiple effects. This would only be possible if an auxiliary condition caused it to vary, which would mean that it was, in truth, not a single condition. The fourth and final way for conditions to produce effects is for a single condition to produce a single effect. However, for this to happen, a single condition must go out of existence completely before the net effect is born, otherwise they wouldn't truly be independent of each other. But if the condition goes completely out of existence, there is nothing left for the effect to be caused by, meaning that we must abandon this as well. The last argument concerning causation I will introduce is that of Shantarakshita on the two ways for phenomena to have svabhava. The two ways a phenomenon can have svabhava are simple or composed of one thing or complex composed of many things. There is no third possibility. First, we can posit the existence of something that is permanent, unchanging, uniform, or unobstructed. This could be God, Brahman, primordial matter, or consciousness, depending on which school was critiquing the Madhyamaka in this case. Shantarakshita says that there, if there is an entity like this, i.e. an entity with simple svabhava that is composed of only one thing, then everything that it causes would have to exist all the time as an effect arises in the presence of its cause always and never arrives during its absence. However, this is clearly not the case in the world that is constantly changing. From the above argument, we can see how singularity is thus incoherent. However, were something to have complex vabhava or be composed of more than one thing, all this multiplicity would really be is nothing but a collection of a bunch of singularities. But if there can't be one singularity, there can't be a collection of them either. This, too, is then incoherent. The second argument against Vabhava is that of change. For this argument, we will call something that moves a mover. A mover cannot exist without motion, and motion cannot exist without a mover because when analyzing each more fully, we find that we can't define the mover in any way outside of motion, nor motion in any way outside of a mover. Thus, neither of them can possess svabhava. When we speak of a blue vase, we can distinguish between the thing itself, a vase, and its properties, being blue. For we can conceptualize something being a vase without it being blue, and something being blue without it being a vase. In this case, we can call being a vase the constitutive property, or what constitutes the thing, and we can call being blue its instantiated property, or what happens to be true of it. But we cannot conceptualize a mover without motion, or motion without a mover. This shows that there is no special property of motion that we can distinguish on its own. The thunder roars is a similar proposition. We can't imagine thunder as a constitutive property without the instantiated property of roaring. However, 
The upshot of this applies even to our blue vase. While we conceptualize the world in certain ways for our own convenience, it is arbitrary. For example, we say that there is a vase which happens to be blue, but this is no more correct than saying that there is a blue thing that happens to be shaped like a vase. So our conception of these properties is purely conventional, and not a sign of anything having svabhava. We thus have a problem in distinguishing between a property and a substance in itself. A classical Indian example is that of water, which can be reduced down to water atoms, which only have one property, that of wetness. But what does this wetness inhere in? It inheres in a bare particular, since it has no other properties. But then we can ask what this property of being a bare particular inheres in, and we have an infinite regress. As David Hume later explained it, try to conceive of something without a property. Further, we can't say that properties themselves have svabhava. This is because we can only distinguish a property by the substances in which it inheres. The third argument against svabhava is that of personal identity. Of course, being a Buddhist philosophy, all of the above rules out the svabhava or selfhood of a human being as much as it does anything else. If there is no self, we might ask, what is it that experiences senses like tasting and smelling? The body is clearly too inconsistent for all of these things to inhere in. In the same way that Nagarjuna denied the substantial reality of a vase that blueness inheres in, he does for a self that the senses could inhere in. In other words, our senses don't necessarily imply the existence of a self any more than blueness necessarily implies the existence of a vase. Our organizing of all these sensory properties around a self is the same kind of artificiality that causes us to conceptualize a blue vase rather than a vase-shaped blue thing. The fourth argument against Fabhava is that of knowledge, which is primarily argued against a long Indian tradition of epistemology. We can say that epistemic objects, or the things we gain knowledge from, such as the things we perceive, infer, or reason, are established by means of gaining knowledge, i.e. perception, inference, and reasoning. These means of gaining knowledge will be called epistemic instruments. There are three ways that we might be able to establish these instruments. The first is not given much time for argument by Nagarjuna because it is not one that the Indian epistemological tradition holds much stock in, and that is mutual coherence. It doesn't say much for the object and instrument to be mutually coherent, because, after all, there are perfectly coherent fairy tales. We might then argue that epistemic instruments are self-established. However, they can't exist independently of an object to be known. Visual perception needs an object of vision. They also cannot be evaluated independently of objects. Out of a number of mechanical devices, we can't decide which one is the best for opening a tin can without a tin can to open. So it is in trying to define an epistemic instrument without something to be known. The third and final way to establish an epistemic instrument would be mutual establishment. An object must be known in order to establish an instrument but it can't be known unless an instrument is established. It is then argued that our general history of successfully perceiving objects is established as an instrument. However, we would need another epistemic instrument to establish that this history of successful perception was successful in the first place. If we had that, 
then an epistemic instrument has already been established and does not need to be established again. If we perceive it without an epistemic instrument, there is no need to establish an epistemic instrument at all. Next, it is argued that because the object is perceived, there must be something bringing about the perception, and this is the epistemic instrument. Because we successfully comprehend something, it means that our epistemic instrument is correct. If we perceive an apple and then reach out and grab it, it is a success, so our instrument is correct. If we hallucinate that there is an apple and do not grab it when we reach out, it is not a correct instrument. Thus, the object known, the apple, establishes the instrument. But here, we need another epistemic instrument to tell if our perception of the apple is a hallucination or not, and if our grabbing it is a success or not. Besides the above incoherencies, many of our beliefs and pieces of knowledge are never tested and or cannot be tested, so we can't use this measure of success to guarantee that they are correct. Thus, we can say that an epistemic instrument is correct either if it leads to success, i.e. by grabbing the apple, or if it has coherence with other epistemic instruments i.e., my memory of putting an apple in the place that I see it. However, the latter proof of coherence requires us to have another set of beliefs that we assume to be true, and would need another epistemic instrument to prove them as well, leading to an infinite regress. With all of the above, we can see thus that epistemic instruments and the objects of our knowledge possess no inherent svabhava either. They only take their status, like blueness and the vase, from how we conceptualize them for our convenience. A similar argument is on propositions and their warrants by Chandrakirti. One may say that a proposition must rest on a foundation of either direct experience or reasoning. However, this is itself a proposition so it must require a warrant of its own or be self-validating. If it requires a warrant of its own, there will be an infinite regress of propositions needing warrants. And if it is self-validating, then all propositions can also be considered self-validating by the same logic. The final argument against Fabhava I will examine in this video leads one to the most challenging end point of Madhyamaka philosophy. This argument is about language and truth. Naturally, with emptiness, the world doesn't exist as it is on its own with an intrinsic structure. Thus, there isn't any intrinsic relation between the structure of our language and that of the world. In fact, our language is highly deceptive, as the only way we can communicate with it effectively is to act like there are real things and concepts with svabhava. Instead of asserting that a proposition is true if it corresponds to the way things are, Nagarjuna says that there is no relation between language and the world that is independent of our own use and conception. Rather than something being true because of its corresponding to an exterior reality, Nagarjuna could see them as being true because they can be asserted coherently. So nothing can be true outside of our ability to consider them true, because to be true on their own would require them to have svabhava. There also, thus, can't be a truth that is beyond our ability to know, because things are only true if we can assess them as true. Those who don't grasp this final part of the Madhyamaka philosophy will claim that emptiness is a kind of ultimate reality to see, the true nature of reality. But there can be no true nature independent of a false nature, 
it would still be nothing more than a projection created by our own conceptions. Emptiness is a negation, arrived at in correcting false views, not an ultimate truth to cling to. To paraphrase an explanation by Chandra Kirti, trying to attach onto emptiness as the ultimate reality is like going into a store and being told there is no milk and asking for two glasses of not milk. The ultimate reality of things is their absence of any intrinsic nature. This is, however, itself, like everything else, dependent. In this case, it is dependent on the false idea of things having svabhava. This means that ultimately, emptiness itself is also empty. As J.L. Garfield says, there is no behind the curtain. The only reality we can ever arrive at would be some kind of conventional reality, meaning that there is no ultimate reality to cling to, or, in the Zen-like words, the ultimate reality is that there is no ultimate reality. Where does this all leave us? This is harder to say. The Tibetan commentary tradition on Madhyamaka have read back into its Indian commentators two camps, one of whom affirms that the Madhyamaka tradition has opinions and propositions of its own to put forth, namely the shunyata of all dharmas, and another of whom believes that the tradition is wholly one of negation, perhaps operating like Wittgenstein conceived of philosophy at the end of the Tractatus, an enterprise of pointing out nonsense. The name Madhyamaka means the middlemost school, and ostensibly refers to the perfect middle path between the idea that things exist with eternal natures and that they don't exist with any natures at all. I will end this video with some quotes from Nagarjuna himself that seem to encapsulate these thoughts. The conquerors taught emptiness as the forsaking of all views. Those who view emptiness are taught to be without realization, incurable and incorrigible. Everything is real, not real. Both real and not real. Neither not real nor real. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Do not say empty or not empty, or both or neither. These are mentioned for the sake of conventional understanding. Whatever is the own nature of the Tathagata, that is the own nature of this world. The Tathagata has no own nature. The world has no own nature. In the emptiness of all things, what ends are there? What non-ends are there? What ends and non-ends are there? What of neither are there? Totally pacifying all reference and totally pacifying fixations is peace. The Buddha nowhere taught any dharma to anyone. Whatever is contingently related, that is explained as emptiness. That is contingently configured. It is the central path. Whatever is the end of nirvana, that is the end of samsara. There is not even a very subtle slight distinction between the two. I bow down to Gautama, whose kindness holds one close, who revealed the sublime dharma in order to let go of all views.